Welcome to our breakout session number one, B2B Bears to Bears, collaborating across campus with Kimberly Henderson and Patricia Cruz. Um, so claps all around for them, everyone. Yes, yes. Patricia um, uses she, they pronouns and serves as an undergraduate academic uh, advisor and co-manager for the School of Public Health. Originally from the San Fernando Valley, Patricia earned her BA in Asian American and Diaspora Studies from the Ethnic Studies Department at UC Berkeley. At UC Berkeley, she has worked with students of color retention and recruitment centers and college access with Oakland youth through um, as, a, as public allies fellow at Oakland Promise. She has found strong partnerships play a key role in creating sustainable and inclusive programming. Kimberly Henderson uses she, her pronouns, is an academic advisor and co-manager in the School of Public Health's undergraduate program and has been with UC Berkeley for two years. She is a Bay Area native, attended college at Humboldt State, receiving a BA in liberal studies and a minor in interdisciplinary dance. From there, she served a year in AmeriCorps as a CSU STEM VISTA at San Jose State University's J. Pistons STEM Education Program, working directly with Mesa Title I Schools and the Tech Museum of Science and Innovation before starting at UC Berkeley. She's excited to have the opportunity to share her experiences from the past two years with you. So with that, um, I will let you all know that this session has closed captioning services. Um, that link will show up in our chat a few times during our session today. Thank you so much, Sarah, for helping us with the closed captioning. Um, again, uh, thank you again so much for your time and participation uh, in today's next Opportunity at Work conference. And with that, I will turn it over to Kimberly and Patricia. All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much, Colin. So this morning, we are going to be stretching our comfort muscle a bit as we learn to be okay with collaborative accomplishments and how we can get there and stay there. So next slide. <clears throat> so yeah, hi, I'm Kimberly. Um, nice to meet everybody, or we probably know some of you. And uh, like Colin said, I'm in the School of Public Health Undergraduate Program, advisor and co-manager. Um, hi everyone, Patricia Cruz. Um, thank you, Colin, for the great introduction. And so I'm, me and Kimberly are kind of partners. So we're both um, the undergraduate program academic advisors and co-managers for the School of Public Health. Um, and next slide. So today's learning objectives, um, we're gonna talk about one, valuing collaboration. As part of a school with nearly over 150 different departments, academic units, and other additional campus units, what is the value we find in collaboration? And two, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion through collaboration and committing to those values. Um, three, lastly, we'll talk about motivation for creation. How do we get creative with how we collaborate? Um, and how do we maintain that momentum? So in this workshop, we'll go over how collaborations have strengthened our department, why collaboration is essential for incorporating new and underrepresented voices in our school, and how we creatively motivate ourselves to keep reaching out. Um, next slide. <clears throat> awesome. So what is collaboration? Um, by definition, it is to work jointly with others or together, especially in an intellectual endeavor. But oftentimes what we'll think of is one, two, three, one partnerships, two creativity connections, and three connection of voices. So with partnerships, you might think of, you know, for example, public health, we partner with EOP to bring advising to um, URM students. Um, but you can also think of partnerships uh, that you do within your own department directly. For two, creativity connections, um, you might think about how are you tapping people's outstanding ideas or are you just or, or just the ones that fit within the boundaries that you are giving them. Silence and open space are scary and they're critical to allow minds to think and then even harder develop the courage to speak up. And then finally, three, connection of voices. So making sure that those underheard or unheard um, voices are being given a space to come to the table and talk. For us, this is 
been seen through student representatives coming into faculty, staff, managerial meetings. Next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about this model from Bruce Tuffman. Um, when collaborating, there's different stages that can be helpful to identify when working in a team. So a great team often takes work and that comes with this forming, storming, norming, and performing um, phases. And so this model was created to represent what typically creates high performing teams and learning how to work together means being able to understand what stage your team might be in. So on this graph, as you'll see, there's first the forming stage and that's when your team is initially built. You get to know one another and there might be some responsibilities, but it might not necessarily be that clear yet. And next is the storming phase. So this is where you start like working together and you might butt heads because conflicts arise or maybe there's different working styles or there's not set processes in place yet um, and or any other unforeseen circumstances. Gradually, the team moves on to the norming stage where you become more familiar and comfortable with each other. In this norming stage, trust has been built and hopefully makes it easier to address conflicts as you all get more comfortable with each other. And sometimes there could be um, overlap between the storming and norming phases as well as new projects come up, different team members come in or new roles come in. And lastly, hopefully um, your team will eventually go to the performing stage. And this is where you're able to perform tasks like a well-oiled machine. And so being, being able to identify which stage your team is in allows you as a leader or even a fellow team member to be able to strategize how to move on to the next stage um, or taking the time in the current stage that you're in. So in the storming phase, for example, how do you build that trust to reach the norming stage? And how do you resolve conflicts during this stage to set it up well for the next one? In the norming stage, how do you continue building the team? Does that mean team building events, um, things like that? And if performing, how do you learn how to delegate tasks for peak performance? So when creating new partnerships with others, you'll be working with new people, new teams. And while your team may not fit neatly onto this graph sometimes, noticing where there's friction in the team can provide areas of focus to ensure that you all have a shared goal in mind and know how to support each other so you can all get to where you need to be. Next slide. So here is a list of all the different collaborations that we could think of that we are in right now. So you'll see things like TAP, summer sessions, study abroad, but as well as different um, areas within our own department. And so now um, after having gone through each of the steps that Patricia just took us through, uh, on the next slide, we're going to break this down into specific stages of where we are with just six of these examples within public health. Um, and we're gonna break down into the different groups of the forming, storming, norming, and performing. And we're gonna share a detailed story about one experience uh, that we've had. So next slide. All right, so in this slide you'll see that we are breaking it down even further. We have different types of collaboration. So we have our academic year cycles of collaboration as well as our continuous collaborating partners. And so the, the academic year cycles, they are more of an in-department um, because we have to collaborate with our students. That's part of that bringing that diverse voice um, into our everyday. Um, but then with continuous collaborations, across campus as well as interdepartmental. So we also want you to see that we recognize we are not in our peak performance stage with all of our collaborators at every, any given time. It's important to recognize this and respect the stages and really embrace them because without doing that, you might try to skip one and um, never be able to reach that true full potential um, of a collaboration with somebody. All right, so our primary example today will be our partnership with our own public health communications and marketing team, a group that our department initially had little to no contact with. Uh, we are currently in a performing stage with them, but it did not start that way. So uh, here we go. So forming stage. First, we had our initial contact with a comms or communications representative. 
uh, the SPH, uh, School of Public Health, was creating a new website and wasn't sure about the undergraduate portion of that website. It was new territory. We discussed who we are and what we did in the undergraduate program. We realized that the comms team didn't understand what the undergraduate uh, department within public health incorporated or how large it was or the different needs it had for our school's website and communications. We didn't fully understand all the ways we should be communicating with the comms team. And just for clarification, SPH is a graduate school. So the comms team had never really talked directly with the undergraduate program before about their needs. We had two follow-up meetings with the comms team, and this all took about four to six weeks. Okay, so about a month and a half to do this first initial communications and getting to know each other. Next, we move on to storming. So we began to meet more members of the communications team and exchange emails. There were many different opinions about what was deemed essential and many discussions both in person and over email deciding these different items. We learned how to communicate if something was important for our students to the communications team. And the comms team worked hard to learn about how different the undergraduate program was from the rest of the graduate programs within the School of Public Health. This took about four months and was uncomfortable. Uh, it was an uncomfortable process as we often felt we were living on the edge, not never knowing exactly where the next turn might be. Um, but again, an essential process of learning how to communicate with each other and that we can trust each other. So, four to six weeks, forming, storming's four months, now we're in norming. So after an understanding was reached, we established a format to request changes and assistance from the communications team for the undergraduate program. We also established trust by making sure to check in with them about our wording going out to the undergraduate population. We tried these things for about five months and kind of found a groove of what really worked not only for the communications team, but for our um, team as well. All right, so four to six weeks, four months, five months, and finally performing stage. So success, uh, we now get changes to the website and communication responses within about 24 hours. Uh, we know how to communicate with each member of the communications team efficiently and who to include in what emails so that we aren't bouncing around a lot. So yeah, next slide. All right, so just as a reminder, those four stages, F, S, and P, forming is establishing that connection. Storming is establishing that trust. Norming is reaffirming that trust and performing is that success that you have to maintain the trust and hold on to. Next slide. So how did collaboration benefit the School of Public Health undergraduate program? Well, as you've heard, our department has collaborated with quite a lot of different on and off campus partners. And as the only two academic advisors and co-managers of the undergraduate program, where we share a caseload of 900 to 1,000 students at any given moment, collaboration has been beneficial for us to create new opportunities, not only for our students, but for ourselves as well. And so first and foremost, collaboration is cost effective. And the university definitely likes to hear that. And especially if your program has limited resources, collaboration can be a way to think of innovative ways to get those services to your students or to the population that you work with. Um, secondly, with collaboration, you get to hear new voices and new ideas. So we work with LNS and LNS recently has these neighborhoods and we work with the biosciences neighborhoods um, or the transfer alliance program, TAP, or even with, like I mentioned earlier, our very own students. We don't know everything, so getting to work with other experts in the area means being able to create new programs or build stronger ones. For example, I'm not going to be 100% knowledgeable about LNS's policies, especially with the ones that have been shifting a lot lately. And so the more I work with them, the more familiar I get with their structure and get a chance to create a network to reach out where I might have a student situation I need more clarity on or starting to think about ideas like should LNS advising have satellite advising? 
um, at the School of Public Health. And for LNS, for those of you not familiar, is the College of Letters and Science. Um, there's also no shortage of different projects to work on because you have a variety of experiences in the room. Nothing's ever too repetitive, which increases your motivation, engagement, reflection, and building relationships with student leaders and others. And you get to reflect on your program as you go and think about where you want to take it as well. And we also get to work on consi consistent messaging and communications and working with others to make sure the most accurate information is shared on the website, um, making sure the policies are up to date for less confusion, especially as misunderstandings from old policies arise. And so this all leads us to being able to identify gaps and effectively coming up with solutions while in community with each other. Next slide. All right, so now we're here and we want to start thinking about questions that you can ask yourself to reflect on how you are doing in your own collaborations. As a reminder, that first step, the forming step, it's, it's a meeting, it's a communications, and it's, it's getting to know a, another human being. And this can sometimes feel like a waste of time at first. You could be answering so many more emails that are sitting in your inbox. No, this is just like a friendship, a romantic relationship, it's a human. And so you need to get to know who they are in order to work with them and develop that trust. All right, so without further ado, let's go through these questions together. These are things that you should be asking yourself just as a, a check-in, right? All right, so questions to ask yourself and to write out. Who do I work with every week? Who do I consider a partner? Who do I work with within my own department? All right, and then questions to ask to strengthen collaborations that you already have. How often do I check in with them? Have I ever asked or had a discussion about who they are? Ask their thoughts. Are they well? Are they sleeping well? Uh, arrange to have coffee, tea, or water with them outside of the office. Do I schedule time throughout the semester or year to check in with them? And if not, do I frequently check in with them as a given? Next slide. So with the busyness of our day-to-day -day work schedule, we know how hard it is to find time to reflect. And so here we save aside 10 minutes for you to think about on your own and, and share in the larger group later on in the chat um, what collaboration looks like in your department. We'll also share a link in the chat box um, with kind of some of the slides that we went over. So you have that graph to look over. These questions will also be there. Um, and so I'll read off the questions on this slide. For example, who are you already collaborating with? How did you get to that point? Who could you collaborate with? Any ideas, um, like campus partners, off-campus partners? Or why are you not collaborating? Are there internal problems that need to be addressed first, right? And are you collaborating more than you thought? And if so, how can you strengthen those? Or how important are those relationships? So you don't need to answer all these questions during this time. And you can continue to have these questions like after the conference today. Um, but after this 10 minutes, we'll do a larger group share out in the chat box where you all can share with each other. Now we'll share these thoughts anonymously um, in the next slide. So if you don't want yours like read out loud by us, we're going to summarize it. We're not going to read it verbatim. Then just put like right before you write yours, please do not read out loud. Um, but if you put it in there, at least the other folks in the room can also read your wonderful ideas as well. And we'll also, I'll start the 10 minutes now and then we'll give a two minute notice. Um, yeah. And if any questions pop up, feel free to ask them in the chat as well. Okay, everyone, we um, have the link to the reference reflection guide in the chat. Go ahead and download that document as a PDF. And thanks, Patricia, for keeping us on time. We'll start our timer now.
Okay, everyone. So just popping in here to say two minute warning. Um, so two more minutes to wrap up your thoughts. Um, go to the bathroom, get some tea. Okay, so we'll be going back into a larger group now. Um, next slide, please. Oh, so now, welcome back, everyone. I hope that was a good reflection or rest time. So share in the chat and we'll share um, your thoughts. So some of the questions that we have here um, for things to share with the larger group is, what are some new things that you've learned or key takeaways? What was interesting that someone shared? Um, what are some challenges you have faced or are facing with collaboration? And what type of collaborations are you doing or thinking of doing? And like I mentioned before, we're gonna be kind of summarizing the things you share in the chat box. So if you don't want us to read those, please put before your chat, please don't read out loud um, since this session is being recorded. Hmm. Don't be shy. You could answer these questions or the questions from before or just any insights that you might have had throughout the session. All right. So we have someone saying, in a lot of instances, finding time to collaborate feels like a roadblock. So it's setting aside that really important time in the calendar to connect with people and placing those priorities. We also have uh, the primary takeaway for me was the importance of seeking out new collaborations in areas that wouldn't typically be related to my primary responsibility. It can be so um, not only relieving, but eye-opening to get to talk with people in a department that you don't normally talk with. And sometimes just um, it, it gives you it gives you insight, but it also gives you that support in places where you never thought you'd need support from. All right. I've been on campus for a long time and I count on my historic relationships to continue, but I realize that I need to remain active in continuing creating relationships and checking in on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. That is wonderful. Historical bases can be wonderful, um, but things are constantly changing. And so um, we have to keep up with all that. Some challenges, connecting teams within an org to invite cross collaboration. Mm -hmm. Sometimes office politics can be uh, can feel hard to navigate, most definitely. And I see, I'm realizing how informal most of my maintenance of collaborative relationships has been. Now that we are all working from home, I'm mindful uh, many of my colleagues have childcare issues. I'm not sure how to nurture these relationships intentionally, 
but without adding any burdens to my collaborators. Yes, we, especially during this time, we kind of have to be innovative with how we check in with each other, right? Like, is it sending, I personally, um, I send like cute cat or dog gifs sometimes, gifs, gifs, um, but it is different and being aware of these different issues too, right? Um, and the different experiences that the people you're working with have. Awesome. I think we have time to read two or three more. So um, I learned how important it is to establish and reinforce trust. Additionally, some of the challenges I face are lack of collaboration due to scheduling conflicts or lack of knowledge of other departments. Mm -hmm. And then, let's see, y'all are sharing such great stuff. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, and we'll go over more at the end too when we have time. Uh, so two more. I used to take people to lunch randomly and it was a great way to form trust and get to know people. I agree it is now much harder to build trust and collaborate from home. Oh yeah, most definitely. Uh, Patricia, do you want to read one more? Yeah. Um, so someone wanted to echo another thought that was shared earlier. So finding the time to collaborate, especially in a virtual world where a lot of this collaboration can take longer is difficult. So they found options where Zoom meetings are good, but sometimes you need a one-on-one -on -one check in and emails take so much longer to write up. I hear you. And the Zoom time isn't always there. Very, very real. All right. So due to time, we do have to move on. Um, but please, everyone, go read what's in the chat. And if we have time at the end, we'll read some more. So. Next slide. Yeah. All right, so this slide says it all. How to stay motivated. So how do we stay motivated when we are in these different stages? And it might be slightly different than you think. So the best part is that you are not alone. You are not alone. Uh, you have so many people who want to help and could benefit from working with you. So you just got to take that first step to reach out and begin establishing those connections. So tips on keeping up with collaborators. One, two, three, organization, self-care, and honesty. So these are what we have found have made the strongest connections uh, over time. So organization. Uh, having so many collaborations can be overwhelming. Keeping a clean calendar and setting honest, realistic time goals is a must. You think that meeting will only take an hour? Mm, you better plan for an hour and a half plus 15 minutes for that walk if we're in person. Uh, might be 15 minutes for a water break afterwards. Reset your mind. Set that time aside for yourself. So self-care, uh, it's hard to work with someone if they're tired or distracted or they seem unwell. Your health is first and foremost. We're gonna go more into that. And often tied to keeping an honest schedule. This also includes time uh, for that walk or for just taking a break during the day. Honesty, don't lie or even white lie about what you can do and what your team can or can't do. Do not overpromise your team. Always remember that honesty, transparency, and communication are a key to any successful um, collaboration. Next slide, please. All right, so emphasizing self-care, especially during this time, uh, Patricia mentioned that we send GIFs often to our students, but we also send them to our collaborators and fellow staff and faculty. So these are just a couple of examples. So we've got our self-care hedgehog, focus on yourself, take care of your body, be mindful of your inner voice, remove those negative comparisons. We also have our rest stop ghost. So how are you feeling? How's your body doing? Take a few deep breaths. So sometimes I, when I need to, I will even set these as my laptop background because I just need to remind myself to stop for a moment, take a break, um, and reminding myself that I'm not doing it just for me. I'm doing it for the benefit of all the people that I work with, with as well as my own family. Next slide. 
And finally, remember that this skill, collaboration, is like any muscle in your body. You have to train it in order for it to be strong, and then you have to keep using it to be able to keep it that strong or keep it that way. So reminders, forming, storming, norming, performing, and yes, you can do it. No, it won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. Next slide. And lastly is our contact information. So here we have me and Kimberly's personal Berkeley emails. So that's where you could reach out to us individually. And then we also have our School of Public Health undergraduate email as well. If you have a student question or want to talk more about the undergraduate program, feel free to also like CC all of those if you're not sure like which one to send it to. Um, and next slide. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, we're gonna be taking questions in the chat only. Uh, we will not be using the video or audio functions for participants. Um, so this is your chance to ask questions of our presenters, Kimberly and Patricia. And um, also, you know, if we have a little bit more time, maybe we can read some of those amazing additional responses that were coming in to some of the reflections of um, the questions today. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll open it up for questions and comments and then don't leave because we do have our raffle winners <laughs> and we have our survey that we'd love for you to fill out. Um, so we'll go ahead and take uh, time to answer your questions. And we'll read those in the chat. And please stay back because if you win the raffle, you gotta be here to, to know that you won the thing. <laughs> Um, I see someone does have a question saying, how do you get to know someone that doesn't want to open up? I'm sure we all are. We have all hit roadblocks when collaborating with colleagues. I believe in team building exercises. Can someone share a team building exercise they have participated in here on campus? Um, so I can take that first one. Um, how do you get to know someone that doesn't want to open up? Well, I think that when you encounter someone that isn't potentially like ready to open up, it's important to respect that um, and come back at a later time. If this is a collaboration that, you know, it's, it's not a choice, like you need to collaborate with this first person because um, they, are, they, they have access to an essential, you know, um, module that you have to you know, like use on campus or fix something, uh, information about your own department with that person within that other department, then um, you do the best you can to respect their boundaries. Um, oftentimes, if I get like a cold email, I will still be my authentic self. And normally over a couple of months that will shine through to the other person and, um, you know, I'll feel some reciprocated. Uh, you know, caring in their own way. I think it's also really important to understand and know that not everyone is going to respond and reciprocate, you know, that kind of care and that kind of um, collaboration relationship the same way. So some people might be a little bit more stern or gruff and that's their way of saying like, I take you seriously. Other people like Patricia and myself were a little bit more like, you know, we like to do the fun, GIFs and things like that. So not everyone is like that. And it's really important to recognize how people um, show their appreciation for you in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes check-in questions, if you're able to, like in meetings, have a check-in question. It could be something fun, like um, if you were a raindrop, where would you fall and why? And sometimes like those kind of questions aren't too personal and then it kind of lets you learn about each other's personalities. Um, but that's if you have time in the meetings to do those. Um, another question I see is how do you rebuild trust in your team? So a common theme that we're seeing here is there's the saying I like to say Kit Kat, but the second, the second K is a C. So keep it true, communication, accountability, and transparency. As Kimberly mentioned in the previous slide, slide don't tell any white lies. Like, Keeping it true, especially when there's organizational change, 
um, when there's so many transitions and uncertainty, keeping it true, communicating and being transparent about where your capacity is and being accountable for things um, is kind of the best way to kind of rebuild that trust. And it's going to be a long process. It's not going to happen like the next week and there's going to, you know, be some rough edges around there, but hopefully in the long term, that's how you will rebuild it. All right, I see. How could campus staff organizations help facilitate new collaborations among offices? How could campus, campus staff, campus staff organizations? I think, so for this question, I'm, wonder, I, I'm wondering for clarification, like, is this campus staff organizations like specific organizations within within the campus coming into different departments in multiple offices? Um, or is this, I mean, things like BSA and Align, Alignza. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I know BSA right now is doing the mentor-mentee program and that's a super wonderful program. Um, I don't have actually any ideas off the top of my head, um, but I do have connection with people in those. So if I think of any, I'm definitely going to reach out to them and let them know. Um, yeah, I think reaching out and being aware of the different organizations is definitely um, a good thing with these campus organizations. I feel like there's a lot of not turnover, turnaround, because people are in leadership positions for so long. And so reaching out every now and then, especially when there's new leadership, um, is very important and doing your part, I think, to also know of like, what are other campus organizations that might need support? And what are some things that we can offer, right? Or sometimes you might even want to just be like, hey, I, I know that it's important for us to collaborate. I'm not quite sure if I have an idea yet. And if you have the capacity to do so, um, let's think about this. Or maybe it is waiting that one year until that organization does have more time, but um, being aware of what that organization already does and seeing like, okay, if you both have social events, how can you work together on that? Um, but I think the people in those organizations would best know like what they most need right now. And so connecting is definitely a good step. I see in the chat, someone was saying what type of team building has been successful and fun and that was at someone else in the chat um but i just want to like mention a couple things that we've done with them with our own partners um turning office meetings into walking meetings often has proven to be a lot more comfortable people become more open as they're you know because you don't have to make direct eye contact all the time but um but you you're you're able to like release some energy and get out of the office. Um, with our virtual uh, state right now, multiple meetings have turned into phone call meetings where it's like, hey, put your headphones on, let's go outside and walk around with our masks on as we talk through this collaboration and ideas. So yes, meeting, walking meetings are super great. Um, with our peer advisors, as well as a couple of other um, groups like we've done with TAP, um, we create slideshow presentations and, and kind of guide them through like our thought process with images. Um, we also start meetings with, you know, either a deep breathing or going around the table so that every voice is heard in the room. Um, I think that that's taken it's not taken as seriously as it should that every single voice in the room um, be heard, even if it's just for 30 seconds at the meeting, at the beginning of the meeting saying how they're doing. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for your wonderful comments and questions. Uh, in this moment in time, I'm going to be including the link for this presentation survey. We appreciate if you please fill that out now. Also wanna take a moment to thank our fabulous presenters this morning, Kimberly Henderson and Patricia Cruz for a great presentation, um, as well as a reflection debrief. All that jazz, thinking about strengthening ways that we can collaborate on campus. Thanks so much for joining us everybody and have a wonderful day at 2020's NOW Conference, Envisioning Your Future. <laughs>